I thought perhaps the right place to start would be in terms of, of why this topic. And actually, there, there are actually three reasons. First of all, British Crop Protect Production Council, I think very familiar to most in terms of its um, work on pesticides. And so part of the reason for giving this talk is to say that BCPC is actually interested in the whole range of, of crop production systems, including organic. Um, but secondly, um, organic farming tends to have an image of being anti-science. And actually, I think there's a reasonable amount of, of ground for, for why that is. And yet, I'm actually very clear that, that organic agriculture is supported by a tremendous science base. And I think it's important to identify that because like all other forms of agriculture, organic agriculture needs to develop and it needs to develop by basically making use of its science base. And thirdly, um, I wanted a chance to actually talk a little bit about people and people in relation to agriculture because basically people are the reason why um, new technologies and new things either will get adopted or will not. So I want to start with, with a system um, uh, looking at different sorts of farming systems. I've identified four on there. I've actually sort of linked them uh, left to right. Um, but I've only actually given you sort of um, driving values for, for, for two of them because I don't want to spend too much time on it. Although I've used the word value, and I actually believe that, that these are the values which underpin what has been done, by laying them out in that way and by actually listing those things, I am not making a value judgment. I think there is nothing wrong with the values which go with an intensive system. Um, they're just different to those which go with um, an organic system. Um, and, and the important thing to note is clearly that in terms of organic farming, um, there's a major drive to minimize costs, to maximize yields, to externalize whatever you can um, within the system, and by and large, to, to, to run the thing on a very linear model. And that it contrasts enormously with the organic system, which really is about the management of biological cycles, optimizing rather than maximizing yields, product health, and it very much works on the basis of a network model. Um, so if the values that drive those two sorts of systems um, are as different as that, then it's not surprising that, in fact, they will produce different sorts of products and that they will work in very different ways. And if you take from that, perhaps, what is the underpinning um, ethos sitting behind organic systems, I think it's what I've said here, which is basically that if you've got the crop healthy, you've got the soil healthy, um, basically you can run it on that basis. Um, and a sense in the rest of the talk, I just want to explore some of the implications which would come from that. But I want to actually start with um, things that two of the founders of the organic farming movement have actually said. So here we've got Sir Albert Howard, um, worked in the tropics in the 1920s and 30s, um, and he came up with these four things as basically key things in terms of, of um, a successful farming system. Um, and the one that I really want to pull out from this, of course, is the fact that he was identifying the importance of mycorrhizal associations as being vital to health. Um, but basically what he was saying is basically if we get the soil health right, um, then um, all sorts of things will, will, will flow from that. Not a terribly clear photograph. It's taken from his 1945 book. Um, it's a picture taken at East Malling um, in the early 1930s in one of the first East Malling root laboratories taken by, by Stephen Rogers. Um, but the point of the picture is, and it, it, it even on the, the picture in the book doesn't ca come out terribly clearly, if I can get the thing to do, just there, those of you who've got good eyes will be able to see some fungal hyphae, and again, you can see some more there. And the point was being made that, in fact, um, you got colonization of apple roots very early in their life, and this actually was very important to, to running an organic system. If we move on to the other founder of the organic farming movement, Lady Eve Balfour, um, which um, Nigel referred to, 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 to earlier, um, here, in a sense, if you like, are the four core things that I took out of Lady Eve's book, um, and again, um, the bottom one in this case, mycorrhizal fungi. So both of the founders of the organic movement are basically saying very, very important um, um, mycorrhizal fungi. And so I thought I would put a mycorrhizal fungi over the top of, of probably the most famous um, Lady Eve quote. Um, the picture you're looking at above, actually taken um, at the University of Michigan's biological station in their biotron and some work that 
Bob Fogel and I were doing on, on mycorrhizal fungi, um, the area that you're looking at is roughly um, 10 millimeters from top to bottom and 15 millimeters from side to side. Um, the fungi you can see that were produced in a period of about 12 hours after um, a heavy rainfall, after um, a dry period. Um, and within seven days, half of those would have gone um, and disappeared back into soil fabric. So it's just to make the point that, in fact, um, mycorrhizal fungi can be um, quite prominent in soil and they do turn over extremely rapidly. So they're actually a very major part of, of the dynamics of the, of the soil system. And perhaps the other thing to, to emphasize is just the antiquity of the mycorrhizal relationship. As the top one makes uh, very clear, they've been around for almost half a billion years. Um, and so this is a very ancient um, relationship and that's why, of course, it's very solid and, and very, very important. So if we come to an organic farming system and the, um, the way that, 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 that it actually works, what I've tried to do here is to show what would be, sorry, what would be fairly normal for a Scottish organic farming system, half um, crops, um, half grassland, um, stock and crops in the same thing, um, and to... to um, point out basically where the mycorrhizal fungi come in and where you're trying to actually use the rotation um, to um, maintain the mycorrhizal status of plants, um, partly as a means of, of getting your, your nutrient capture right, but partly as a means of trying to get your crop protection right and the thing built into the working of, of, of the system. Um, and the same goes in fact for the animal part of the thing where basically you're managing grassland and you're managing grassland both to, to alter the speciation of, of nutrients in the soil, but also to, to get the microbiology right for the coming series of, of, of cereal crops. So if we look at the things upon which crop protection in an organic farming system, bearing in mind that, that the um, soil association and, and international rules do not allow you to use any conventional pesticides, um, these are the things upon which crop protection depends. Breeding for, for resistance, very important. Um, reducing the amount of, of surplus nitrogen so that you don't get soft growth. Um, rotation um, to, to influence pathogen levels. Mixtures of crop genotypes. But the thing, of course, I want to talk about really is this box here, mycorrhizal infection, and basically how mycorrhizal infection um, uh, has an impact. So, do mycorrhizas affect the ability of crops to resist pathogens? Um, here's some tomatoes grown in pots, um, little uh, ability to, to use all of the potential ways of, of resisting. Control plant there, mycorrhizal plant there, slightly smaller, they're obviously clean in this case, was a carbon penalty. Um, mycorrhizal with phytophthora, it's reduced, but not nearly as bad as, as when the mycorrhiza were, um, were not present. So um, basically, can mycorrhiza give a degree of protection against phytophthoras? The answer is yes, they can. The question then becomes basically, you know, how does that protection um, occur? And if we look at the impact of mycorrhizal fungi on a whole range of things, um, clearly it's important to note that it affects the size of the root system, it affects the form of the root system, um, and it affects a whole realm of, of dynamic elements in relation to the root system. And now I want to go on and, and look at some of, of, of those. So there we have um, uh, uh, a, a cherry root. Um, um, and you can see there's a lot of hyphae on the outside of it. One of the questions that often is asked, particularly in relation to things like wheat or grass plants, where the um, level of infection um, that you find in the root, and it's usually done in terms of the percentage of one centimeter root lengths where you can find evidence of a mycorrhizal being present, um, it can be low. Um, and people look and say, well, you know, 5%, can it really do anything? Um, in tree crops and things, the sort of figure, um, and most legumes, the figures you'd be looking at are something between 20 and 70%. Um, I've put in means because I want to do something with this, but it's the curse of the percentages. Um, and if you actually look at um, the length of root which sits under a square centimeter of soil surface um, in grasses and cereals, it's something between the range of 100 and 1,000, and values of 5,000 are not unknown. I picked a mean of 300 compared to um, 
tree crops and legumes where the numbers are down at between 1 and 25, and you combine those two together, and you still end up, even with these low levels of infection, with far more mycorrhizal fungi and a volume of soil than you do for, for the very heavy mycorrhizal crops. So, yes, there is enough there to actually do something. So, how might mycorrhizal fungi influence um, plant health? Um, and the ones that I want to talk about are modification of the form of the root system, um, changes to duration of risk, and um, um, impact upon stresses. Infection with mycorrhizas has an effect upon root branching. Um, and here I've expressed it in two different ways. Um, this is the um, length, uh, the, the number of, of new roots that come out of an individual length of root, and that's the total number of, of root branches coming out of a particular order. For primary roots, you can see no difference from a control, but once you get beyond that, 200% increase, or 181, 219, 717, and in terms of, of quaternary roots, um, a significant increase in the number of quinary roots coming from them. So mycorrhizal root systems are much more heavily branched um, than our control root systems. I'm sorry for the quality of this slide. Um, I had to photograph a paper because um, I'd lost the original diagram for this. Um, but it's simply to, to show that the same thing applies in strawberry, um, which if you look, you'll see there's an extra column here. These are the quinary roots, quinary roots um, with mycorrhizal fungi. And the reason I show that, because I next want to move on to some um, necrosis data, basically showing that, that um, phytophthora in strawberries greatly reduced in mycorrhizal plants. Um, now, in one sense, that's a surprise because if you increase the branching, you've got a lot more root tips, and given that Phytophthora infects just behind a root tip, you might expect that you'd actually get more infection because there are more tips. Um, and indeed, in control plants, um, looking at a correlation between um, the amount of, of root and, and necrosis, um, uh, that is the case. There's a positive correlation, but in the mycorrhizal plants, the correlations are negative. Um, the more branching you got, actually the less necrosis you actually found. So other things in terms of the duration of risk, well clearly the length of time that a root was present in the soil would be part of duration of risk. Um, we can use um, mini rhizotron techniques and, and associated computer software to track roots um, with time. Um, and um, there is an effect of mycorrhizal fungi on how long roots live. Um, it varies between different species, as you can see. Um, in poplar, um, mycorrhizal roots lived less long than controls, same in, 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 um, in, in uh, ryegrass, but, but not in clover. I don't know why there is a difference, but we always find a difference in root length, one way or the other. So, um, how does mycorrhizal fungi affect sort of the health of the plant? Um, clearly, there are possibilities for general growth regulation, but what I want to suggest is that one of the things that they do do is they act as biosensors. And I just want to show one example to, 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 to show that. It's a graph showing water use on this axis and soil water potential on this axis. Um, the lines are the fitted regressions to the data from, from this experiment. The hard line is the control. The two dotted lines are two different mycorrhizal fungi. Not surprising, um, as soil dries out, the rate of transpiration falls. It's what we would expect to happen. But what I want to point out to you that, in fact, when the soil is moist, conditions are good, the mycorrhizal plants were using more water than the controls. But once, in fact, the soil dried out, the mycorrhizal plants start to use a lot less water than the controls. Um, we did a large number of stomatal measurements um, on these plants at round about this sort of point. Um, and as we know, I mean, uh, on any one plant, um, not all the stomata will be in the same condition, even on the same leaf. Um, um, and so on the control, you can see half the stomata um, were, were fa fairly close to, to closed, um, a range and a significant number at high. In terms of the mycorrhizal plants, um, a majority of them actually were, were cl either closed or very close to closed. So I think what I want to say is that um, it's important as we look at the technologies that we're introducing to recognize that there are lots of different systems, lots of different ways of doing agriculture. It's very easy to come under the view that in a sense there is just one way of doing it. And really what I want to say to you is um, that, that there are other ways of doing it. 
and it's important that we think about systems like organic farming um, because it is a very major system on a world basis and therefore something that we need to work our science into. Thank you.